In every academic discipline, there are certain technical words that soon become cliches and stereotypes. And I need not mention to you that every academic discipline has its technical vocabulary. And certainly, modern psychology has a word that is used probably more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. This word is the ringing cry of modern child psychology. And certainly, we want to all live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I must say to you, as I move to my conclusion, that there are certain things within our social order to which I am proud to be maladjusted, and to which I hope all men of goodwill will be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I must honestly say that I never intend to be adjusted to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. And so I say that there is a need in a real sense for a new organization in our world, and that is the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Men and women who he maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day could cry out the words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, as maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free, as maladjusted as Thomas, Jeff Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, could scratch across the pages of history words lifted to cosmic proportions. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with a certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. With this kind of work and with this kind of faith, 1964 can be a great year of achievement. With this faith, faith we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. With this kind of work and with this kind of faith, 1964 can be a great year of achievement. With this faith, we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. This will be the day when America becomes a great nation. It will then be truly the land of the free and home of the brave. And welcome everyone. I am Dani Cesario. And I am Elisa Holland. And we are the co-chairs of AIA, AIA New York's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. We are so excited to present the annual J. Max Bond Jr. Memorial Lecture and the opening lecture of the National NOMA Conference tonight. As in previous years, this talk gathers the greatest minds in national and international architecture, design, and education. What you see when you look around uh, this evening is the fruition of a partnership between our committee and NICOBA NOMA. This lecture honors the legacy of J. Max Bond Jr. by elevating the themes that he championed throughout his career. These include community, education, civil rights, and global perspective. We might say that this evening is about legacies. From our brilliant keynote speaker, Zena Howard, you will learn about constructing a legacy of socially committed architecture and planning. She learned with the best, the recently departed and 
and widely respected Phil Freelon. Our equally esteemed moderator, Mabel Wilson, has also built a legacy informed by historical design practices that center the black experience. These are the legacies that matter, change and shape the world for an enlightened future. We're proud and privileged to be a part of the collaborative team here. In particular, Samantha Josephat, president of Nicobinoma, who is actively building her own legacy. Thank you, Danny and Elisa. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Samantha Josephat, and I am the president of NICOBA NOMA, the New York Coalition of Black Architects, which is also the National Organization of Minority Architects New York chapter. In 1970, 15 black architects, including principals of, other, of others representing black firms, gathered to establish NICOBA. Of those founding firms was Bond Rider Architects, Max Bond's first firm. NICOBA's mission today is to advance the influential voices and the, to promote quality and excellence of minority design professionals. This year's NOMA conference is themed Believe the Hype, a global collective of industry change agents. Our discussion throughout the conference will share insight on how we as architects work strategically as with other disciplines on a global scale, a testament to J. Max Bond's legacy. As a professor at City College's Spitzer School of Architecture, I am proud to be educating our future architects and embracing the legacy of Max Bond that he has built as Dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture from 1985 to 1992. Please welcome Sean Rickenbacker, director of the J. Max Bond Center for Urban Justice located within the School of Architecture at Spitzer, at City College. Thank you, Samantha. Good evening, all. Uh, thank you. A reply. I'm, I'm going to borrow from Mark and do that one more time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Great. Uh, it is truly wonderful uh, to see you all gathered here in honor of J. Max Bond, Jr., uh, his visions, as well as his unwavering commitment to social uplift through built form. I'd also like to acknowledge, as Deanna has as well, uh, the loss of another great line of our profession, Phil Freelon, who will be dearly missed in our collective quest for more equitable and just design, both as a profession, as a creative endeavor, and as a commitment to these people who have paved the way for us all here. So as mentioned, I'm Sean Rickenbacker, the director of the J. Max Bond Center for Urban Futures at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York. The Bond Center was established by the generous support of the firm Davis Brody Bond, the Bond family, and friends. The center continues to embody the legacy of Max to this day, where we remain committed not only to justice and design justice, uh, but also to creating new knowledge that will help build form to empower the very people it seeks to serve. And as Max realized and eloquently stated, and I quote, architecture inevitably involves all the larger issues of society, end quote. This thought is perhaps more pressing now than in recent past as so many of society's issues play out in our built environment. So with that, uh, as I look forward to, as I know you do as well, um, hearing two amazingly inspiring speakers, figures who uh, I truly admire and whose work uh, and their commitment to our craft, our profession, um, 
is a testament to their understanding and embodiment of Max's principles and beliefs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Dr. Mabel Wilson, and also to tonight's keynote speaker, Ms. Zena Howard. Well, good evening, and um, it's such a pleasure to be here. So, um, you know, it's, it's not only a pleasure, it's humbling to think about um, the folks that have stood uh, in this place, Dr. Martin Luther King, Max Bond, Phil Freelon. Um, so it's really, truly an honor to address you in the, in the legacy of, of those people. So um, I'm going to uh, just queue up things here for a minute. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I am 16 years working with uh, formerly the Freelon Group with Phil Freelon in a legacy of culture. Um, and over, that, over those 16 years, um, we've come to define culture very differently um, from many different lenses. So I want to talk to you a little bit today, and I look forward to the discussion right after with um, my colleague, Mabel Wilson. Um, about uh, culture and why it's valued and the importance of it. So this sort of starts from the notion that um, we know that the most important environments throughout history have been cultural um, destinations and institutions. And in thinking about where we wanted to take culture, and, and uh, Phil and I and many of my team members here um, from the Freelon Group and also Perkins and Will, and I want to acknowledge um, many of my colleagues here today, there were essentially nine tenets that we believe that culture must do, should always do, um, cultural projects and the built expression, and that we should hold to those and see how we can sort of translate these, um, these tenets to other areas uh, and disciplines in, in the world of design. Um, strengthening connections between people, extremely important. Um, collecting, sharing, and preserving history is another critical aspect of, of culture. That ability to build community awareness, and that leads to um, creating shared experiences that we'll talk about, and memorable experiences as well. Um, embracing that, that cultural identity amongst uh, different people. Uh, creating transformative experiences so that people are able to, um, to actually envision themselves in, in circumstances um, other than where they are sometimes. Celebrating memory. And that thirst for knowledge, that ever uh, unquenching thirst that we all have to, um, to constantly learn. And finally, um, honoring unique assets. Uh, as we talk about uh, MLK, and as I stand here today, this is actually an, an image of our National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. Uh, this is the MLK Gallery, where um, we have those, those uh, wonderful papers that were donated by the King family. And um, when we say unique, they are indeed unique. They are there. They're not even at the um, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So um, it's, it's really, an honor to be able to work on buildings that have historically and traditionally been called cultural buildings, consisting of museums, libraries, um, performance centers, cultural centers. What we have seen through working on many, many projects, um, a lot of which you see here on the screen, anywhere from the, the um, Gantt Center in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, to currently working on the Motown Museum expansion and other projects, International Civil Rights Center Museum. Uh, what we've 
seen is that these projects, they, they tend to do a little more than um, just the original vision of, of honoring displaying. They tend to be iconic, what we call them catalyst. They tend to catalyze um, action in a, in a lot of different ways, and that was intriguing to us. Um, what you see on the screen is what actually has happened around various uh, designs around the country that we've done. Uh, you can see the, in 2018, the, the March for Our Lives rally. That was the rally against um, gun violence, anything from Gay Pride March to the National Women's March. People feel comfortable um, using the spaces in between and around these, these buildings um, as spaces for action. So that is very, very intriguing to us. Um, as we begin to think about how people were gravitated towards buildings and, um, and institutions and the built environment that really they fostered a, a, a space or a place where they felt comfortable, this notion of, of space making. Um, we often hear, heard a lot about the stories. And so really, um, I see the built expression about really about using uh, design to tell stories. And these stories um, aren't just always self-evident. You have to dig hard and mine and dig deep. Um, and that comes through a process that uh, we call discovery. It's a really um, sort of um, intense, meaningful uh, process. Um, it's really, when you think about, thinking about not just uh, collaboration, and um, stakeholder engagement, it's really a process that goes to partnering and co-design. It's fun, but it's definitely hard work. Um, when we think about engaging with these communities, each party must fulfill its obligation and, and contribute in meaningful ways to the process. So um, the word, the, the Latin word for collaborate really means to labor together. So it's really, really um, coming together and in an unrelenting, very committed way uh, to, to explore and drive uh, trust and participatory engagement. So <clears throat> why is this important? Uh, and that's, so when thinking about, okay, uh, you know, wonderful cultural um, projects and, and being, designing those, being a part of, of seeing that come to fruition, um, I thought about what I was hearing from a lot of people that experienced those buildings and beyond, um, and thought about what I've termed as remembrance design. And there are so many people that need to be engaged in the design process that have historically not been engaged. That was intriguing to me. Um, and really, this engagement and, and broadening the perspective to bring people in um, is really towards creating an inclusively, inclusive and culturally sustainable future. So that's, that's the, um, the goal here. So defining remembrance is really about talking about the past and, and, and remembering lost communities, but it's really with an eye towards the future. Um, it's planning a future around a shared vision, but rooted in the past. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. And in my um, way, I talk about this um, approach to design best when I talk through the projects that um, are, we're currently underway that have remembrance at the root of them. So it's, I'm going to talk about five examples of how um, this has come, come to be. And it's, the scale is broad. It's anything from a very small but powerful in, in, impact in a small community to a very large community. The way that you approach um, this type of design, it was, it was unusual for me. Um, when we started thinking about how to engage um, broad people, they, they're not designers, they're not architects, um, engineers, they're not landscape architects, or how do you engage them in partnerships that, um, that are, are really a long haul? They're really for, for um, an extensive period of time. 
So looking at expanding collaborations, each one of these projects that I'm talking to you about involve people that historically we've never collaborated with in the design profession. Sometimes they're, they're historians, yes. Sometimes they're anthropologists, social anthropologists. Oftentimes they're politicians, um, which is new. And so when you think about all that it takes to actually um, change uh, and, and imbue use culture as a lever to, to address some of the, um, the factors that our urban areas are undergoing right now. It's really um, remarkable to understand that we have to broaden um, and think about collaborations in a, in a different way. So the design approach involves pretty much what you, you see there on the screen, these expanded collaborations, um, really understanding the urban cultural assets that exist in a place. Um, leading with culture, we're gonna talk about that. Um, our urban areas are um, changing rapidly, they're growing fast, and um, culture can be used to help, um, to help understand how we do that in a more responsible and socially aware manner. And recognizing all projects as opportunity to mend physical or social rifts. So <clears throat> remember I talked about that, that this all started coming out of um, the history and experience with museums and really believing that you could, the same sort of rigor and thought, critical thinking that, that goes into the design and planning of museums and libraries can be used in the broader cultural landscape. So <clears throat> thinking about how you create these great spaces, um, we call them you know, sort of sense of place, um, it's all about understanding that what makes spaces unique is that they must be rooted in their context. And that's how you create really rich, compelling spaces. And that, the byproduct of that, the natural byproduct is, is spaces that are inclusive. <clears throat> so first project that I really wanna talk about is just um, in Greenville, North Carolina, south of here, of course. It's called Sycamore Hill. And this is about, really, truly about remembering. It's a very small project, um, one acre. So we're gonna start small. H uh, Historic Greenville, North Carolina was a, um, you know, a beautiful, wonderful community in the 60s and 70s. It, um, this is sort of, you see uh, along the river here, this, this kind of stretch of what it was. It was a community that um, had really a, a, a tight, knit a fine grain to it, but the pinnacle of that community was the Sycamore Hill Missionary Baptist Church. It was a church that kind of sat on the corner, and in, the, in this historic African-American neighborhood, that church really represented many things. It, it clearly was a place of worship, but um, beyond that, most of the children and, and young, young adults and adults in that community actually attended this church, and, and so it was sort of a rite of passage. There was a level of, of rigor that was uh, learned um, by going to this church, and most of the, the uh, community members who then went off to start their own lives were, were really successful. So it was really seen as, a, as the anchor of this, um, this wonderful community. So <clears throat> what happened? Um, of course, in the 60s, uh, 70s, we all are aware of um, urban renewal and what the impact of urban renewal on so many cities and African-American neighborhoods specifically across the country. Um, this is a photograph from uh, the, the 60s, uh, late 60s, when that neighborhood was basically erased. So all of the, the homes that were there um, were, were basically torn down. and. In this instance, really, there, there was not even um, not even what one can term a, a betterment put back. A lot of this uh, this urban renewal was under the guise of putting um, development there that would be something other than what was termed as slum. But this, the church, the community fought hard, and they were able to keep the church. And you can see it there, um, circled on the screen and you can see how the road kind of routes around that church. But later on, the church fell to um, what um, 
you know, is, is presumed to be, in many cases, arson. So they did lose the church. Um, so we were bought in um, and actually approached about this, this little, little project, and it took them a while to understand what it was because it's not quite a building. Uh, it's not quite landscape design, maybe urban planning. So um, it was uh, this 1.1 acre on this corner of, a, of the master development that the city has undertaken uh, to put in beautiful um, public space, parkways, um, playgrounds. And so, but when they got to this corner, um, it wasn't that easy. Uh, the, the community uh, is still there and that was displaced um, and the, the um, Sycamore Hill uh, congregation, is many of them are still there, still alive. And they thought that something special needed to be done to recognize um, what had happened with the loss. So in deep engagement with this uh, community, there were really three things that, three categories of things that really stood out to us. Their, their sense of pride w was huge. Um, they had each other. I mean, at one point they said, you know, we didn't have much, but we had each other. So really what was lost was that, that family, that sense of neighborhood and, and community. And the memories are strong. Uh, the sense of spirituality. A lot of the folks that are there not only talked about the, the wonderful music, people that did not attend that church that we talked to, um, you know, from all walks of life and identities, black, white, um, talked about just walking by that church on Sundays and hearing um, across the street and hearing the music that emanated. So spirituality was important and history. Um, they longed for the prominence um, that, was, that was offered by the bell tower and, and the achievements and, and um, just the memories of, of um, the accomplishments that came out of the, that community. So we were intrigued with this notion of the music uh, and um, musical notation and really how that works because it's, it's really what we call freedom within, within a framework. There is some type of framework and, um, and there's freedom in how you then compose music. So thinking about that and also thinking about um, the fact that there were, there were 22 founders, and many of these founders were, were women, ironically, um, of, of that church. And knowing that we're, um, we're really in the exact, almost exact, original footprint of, of the church, and looking at um, sort of the significant aspects or remnants of this historic church. There were, there were certain key places where there were stained glass windows. They weren't everywhere. They were special. They were, they were donated by um, uh, prominent members in the community. Uh, all of these, there were walls that, um, that surrounded the places, the, the key places of gathering, reflecting, um, welcome and, and the choir, the rejoicing, the, the song and the singing. So taking our cues from that, um, we did, we interpreted uh, this 1.1 acre in a way that, that brings back um, this notion of the, of the church in a really fresh way. Um, the people talked about how early on in the church, baptism was done by the river. So um, we acknowledged you know, a, a walk, sort of a stepped terrace that takes you back down towards the river, bringing back um, the memories of uh, the, the grove of trees that was so prominent. It's called Sycamore Hill because those sycamores and a couple of them that are still there um, were everywhere in, in that neighborhood. Bringing back um, interpretive walls and, and really imbuing interpretation into the site to, uh, to, to actually have people appreciate what happened there in that history. Um, so this is our sort of version of rendition of, um, of, of how uh, this um, Remembrance Projects gets expressed in, in the built form. You see the tower that is brought back and the stained glass, we talked a lot about it, um, 
what should that, that be? We don't have a sense of, of, of what that, those stained glass patterns are, but we did have a sense of the original fabric and plaiting of, of the community that was there. So the patterning in our, in our uh, version of the stained glass is really that historic fabric of the, um, of the, um, the plots that were there. We also thought about that tower and how to interpret that in a way that, that, that brings prominence um, back. And, and the tower certainly did have, um, have stained glass, the original tower, in it as well. So looking um, on, that, on that corner as you walk up and getting that sense of pride back. Also looking at interpretation and, and the um, panels that tell the story. So this, a lot of research, these projects involve deep research and deep engagement. So we're not only telling the historical stories of, of people that have gone on to and have achieved and things that happened in the community, but we're also bringing in um, the voices of today, of, of people talking about um, what has happened over the last 40 or 50 years um, since the loss of their community. Thinking about um, that notion of congregating or, or, or worshiping and bringing back the feeling, We're, you know, it's very important that uh, we understand the goal is never to replicate, but always to think about, um, you know, bringing back the feelings and the emotions that people are so passionate about and that they talk about. Um, this project is uh, under construction right now, so um, we look forward to, uh, to celebrating with, with that community here soon. So that's one acre, um, and so that's, that was one of the, the first projects that, that we started this with. Um, next, we went and looked at um, an area in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, and we call this honoring, and, and this is really, this community is called Hogan's Alley, and this is about five acres. So um, most people who, who have been to Vancouver, it's, it's obviously a very beautiful city. It's sort of got the, you know, these tall needle-like glass um, skyscrapers that pierce the sky everywhere you see it. The other thing about Vancouver is that um, their sort of claim to fame is that um, unlike the states that when they uh, were accommodating their, their cars and, and highways and viaducts that they, they kept them sort of on the edge of their cities and didn't, didn't sort of penetrate them and, and plow through uh, neighborhoods and tight-knit communities. But <clears throat> that was true to, to an extent um, there was one area where they did uh, take the off-ramp from the Georgia Viaduct. This is a construction photograph from 1971. And they actually chose um, to route that off-ramp through the only sort of multicultural place, little five-acre place that existed um, at that time. Uh, the the African-Canadian community in Vancouver is a very, very small. And during this time, in the late 60s, early 70s, they all lived in this, this one little area, study area that you see on the screen that, um, that we, we call Hogan's Alley. So the city had a, had a problem. The city is now undertaking a big redevelopment of, um, of this area with, of the Northeast Falls Creek. And when they got to this five acres, the community, um, very, very astute, very intelligent and, and proud um, people that are there um, actually said, no, we're not gonna do business as usual and sell it to a developer and, and develop this as usual. So what's significant about what happened in Vancouver is that this is the first time a development plan actually includes a chapter on reconciliation and cultural redress. And the city actually issued a, a, a sort of a formal apology to that community. Um, and it wasn't just the only African American community. Um, there were also um, uh, Asian Americans that, or Asian um, Canadians that were there, and also um, some First Nations. So it, it was, a, it surely is a, um, 
you know, a precedent that we can look to here in the States and to see how Vancouver is handling this. And also the community there is also um, pursuing a land trust, which is something that will, in a perpetual way, protect um, the development of that land and, and they will have some, some control on how it's developed. So this community was originally, the uh, African Canadians got there through uh, the railroad. It was a, a porter's town, as, as many, uh, many of the, the folks there worked. The rail line, through looking um, at historically what this community was, um, the urban fabric and uses from the, from the late 40s, early 50s, we see that there were many, many um, businesses that were, that were there in the area. There was also, when we look at the built form that was there, um, there was organic form. In other words, this wasn't all, um, it was a mix. This, some areas were in disrepair, and as you can see here, and actually the term um, Hogan's Alley is really more of a, of a term, it's, it's, it's more of a kind of a derogatory term like skid row as they refer to it. it, it um, and, but the community um, sort of made this, owned this term and, and made it their own. Um, the community actually suffered from years of, of disinvestment similar to areas in the, in the United States. So along with that organic form, though, there was very handsome and, and formal built form. So, you know, it was, it was this sort of mix of things that existed in, in the area, um, but it was home to the people that lived there. A lot of the folks in the community had memories of um, these power lines that were pervasive back then, these overhead power lines. And um, they, they spoke so much about it. And actually, during some of our memory exercises, people brought photographs of these power lines. Um, and evidently, the original Hogan's Alley um, had these power lines in it. So as children, uh, the memory was strong. So that was something that, um, that came forth to us. Typically, what we do in engaging communities, and it's very, very important that um, when you think about how you do engagement, it's not about just you know pulling up public notices, inviting the community in, make sure you 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 advertise in all the the um, normal spaces. It's really about the pre work, working with the community to identify the the thought leaders, the people in those communities that have the respect um, and the trust, and that could that could represent. Uh, their interest and so we begin really at that tight-knit group and these are partnerships that um, they I, I can't even say they last the life of the project and quite honestly they transcend so it's sort of like lifetime relationships but working with the in these groups for, for Hogan's Alley we came up with um, five prevailing design themes that um, regardless of what we do we're gonna adhere to these um, there needed to be a, a cultural center a presence on the main street. People in Vancouver, African Canadians, and still today talk about feeling invisible, literally being not seen, because they're such a minority. I think at this time in Hogan's Alley, there were a total of 700 African Canadians in the city that lived in that area that was destroyed. They talked about an organic geometry, wanting something that felt um, their own, and uh, that was a departure from, you know, sort of the rigorous um, uh, uh, geometry and and um, and glassiness uh, and formalism of the rest of the city, and they they thought that the interior, the core, um, could be separate from the from the exterior. A place for passages and storytelling that that can connect people from the inside and outside. And lastly, a, a space for social connection. So, um, you know, together we, we sort of wrote a concept narrative that dealt with porches and the spaces in between uh, um, places. The, the, the in between spaces became really, really important, and, and it harkened back to those early images that I showed you of the the um, museums that we've done, yes, the museums are beautiful, we love, we love architecture design, but what became most important was the spaces around those buildings and in between. So doing this, this narrative and working on this together was really, really important. 
So what we imagined was interpreting Hogan's Alley, restoring it back almost in its original alignment, but in a very different way. Also bringing back that 20 foot five um, wide, narrow lot lines that were there um, and, and sort of interpreting and bringing that small grain scale of the urban fabric back was important to us. There were things that were, that were uh, really important, um, public art, and um, later on I'll talk about why uh, public art is extraordinarily important, I, th I think, my personal opinion in, in every project. Um, vibrant colors, street vendors, dance and entertainment, the ability to feel like um, spontaneity can erupt at any moment, and, and that's what they sort of missed um, from their neighborhoods. Local residents can gather, and there could also be tranquil social activity. So our interpretation of, of this is to think about absolutely anchoring the site with a, with a um, community cultural center. Um, also uh, looking at how um, we bring back housing, um, and, and housing, as we all know, is a, is a huge challenge. Housing in an affordable way, but that at different scales and indiscernible um, from different economic levels living in the community. Looking at, um, at instilling public art, um, we thought a lot about those overhead power lines that everybody um, had memories about and using sort of a metaphor, that in a metaphorical way, to have people rise above um, the, the activity of Hogan's Alley and actually be able to, to um, traverse above over a Hogan's Alley in between the residential units. So the, this would be a place for residents, but below you can see the, the, the small businesses bringing back a little bit of that funk uh, and grit that was so important to that neighborhood. And on the back end, you can see how, how also pulling in public art, making sure that um, that, that is a, um, a key factor in, in this um, sort of reimagined re alley. So that's um, sort of, you know, small scale still, it's five acres. But moving on to, to Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and this is about reshaping um, a core of, of, of uh, this city. So Charlotte, North Carolina is, um, it basically downtown Charlotte has four wards and the ward that we're focused on is, is the second ward that you see kind of outlined there in blue. It's, in the, it's also in a neighborhood that's called Brooklyn, um, back then historically called Brooklyn. And what was really um, important, again, about this neighborhood was that um, this was, as much as an African American can, could achieve at that time and be relatively affluent, that was this neighborhood. Um, African um, American entrepreneurship and, and business ownership was significant. Uh, the level of ownership went from funeral homes um, to grocery stores, restaurants. Um, they owned, there were many, many churches in this area. It's about 17 acres that, that we're looking at. And, and there were several churches, including uh, Grace Amy Zion Church. There was um, a, you see there on the screen, a high school. It's called Second Ward High School that was extremely important to this community. Um, there is a, a Second Ward High School, you know, uh, foundation it, it, that still exists um, because that was in during that time really in that part of the state that was the only area where African Americans can really go to high school graduate with a degree and go on to higher education so that was really the upper echelons uh, representing um, education at that time so uh, what happened in, in second ward um, was the same story that happened everywhere um, you know, what precedes sort of urban um, renewal uh, and, and these areas um, turning into, um, you know, slum or disrepair is, is um, basically shunning 
um, eviction, restrictive covenants, all the things that you, that you put in place to make sure economically uh, the, the space chokes out. And so that's what happened um, here. This is a quote on the screen by Thomas Hanchett. He's one of the historians that we are um, working with on this project. And um, so between 1960 and 1968, um, Brooklyn Village uh, was destroyed. And it's amazing when you look at the historical records of the destruction. Um, some of the homes that were destroyed, you can look at comparable homes that exist there now, and they're, they're over half a million dollar homes now. And so you can imagine if, if, if um, the wealth that is lost from generation to generation, by the ability to, um, to lose uh, so much. So there was over um, 1,400 structures demolished, but 1,000 households were displaced, over 1,000, and um, over 200 black-owned businesses at that time. So our approach to this um, project was, again, to look at the historical map. And what we noted um, that was important here is that the the streets, there were certain streets that, um, that, that bisected both parts of our development, the uh, 11 and a half acres on the top and the um, sort of five and a half acres on the bottom for a total of about 17 acres. The middle part um, is, is not owned uh, by uh, the, the city and the development team at, at that point, so it was really bifurcated. We thought that it was important to, to look at what was there, the streets. There was one in particular called Meyer Street that, that seemed to be a prominent street that connected all of these um, different businesses and points of interest that we see here, and we sort of mapped from 1957 to today. And so what resonated with us was reinterpreting and, and bringing back in what we called Meyer's Passage. And along that way, putting in um, the historical markers, the interpretation, the elements in the, in the landscape that um, tell the story of the generations and generations and generations of, of um, African Americans that, that were once there. This has a large, um, over two acre park, so we imagine anchoring that with a, um, with a, with a cultural center as well and also looking at ways to uh, engage public artists. Um, this, this is placeholders for the design team, but thinking about how you can, you can bring in artists to interpret perhaps the stained glass windows or, or the um, historic grid in, in the landscape that was once lost. So that, um, that's you know a little bigger, 17 acres. Um, we had an opportunity to, to look at Miami, and, um, and this is about recapturing or restoring lost energy in 30 acres down in Miami. Miami um, over town is significant. It's a historic district. Um, if anybody's kind of gone down there, it's, it's sort of um, northeast of the city, south, south of Wynwood. A, Beautiful area, what's attractive about that area is what's attractive about um, any area that, that is this close to the heart of, um, of downtown, the, um, where real estate is skyrocketing, very expensive. Um, this land is, is extraordinarily valuable. What was interesting about um, our historic Overtown site is that um, it was owned almost 50-50, most of the land that's owned there is owned by, probably half of it, by the CRA, Community Re Redevelopment Authority, and the other half is owned by a private developer. And um, normally it's very difficult to impact 30 acres in um, adjacent to, you know, a prized downtown area because you can't, you can't get ownership that, that's that, you know, massive. But the CRA and this private developer came together um, with the shared vision of reimagining Overtown. So what happened? Looking at Overtown in 1936, 
Um, you can see it was, uh, you know, it was actually just an intact street grid. There were relatively small blocks and streets that were really walkable dimensions. Um, so what happened? Interstate 395 and 95, a double whammy. So the sort of um, square shape that you see uh, on the screen was the extent of Overtown. So really it ripped the heart of, of that city um, out. So, but we have an opportunity, even with this I-395 and I-95 ripping through there, you can see even today um, that the area still jo enjoys an intact street grid, if you, if you look at it and, and think about it um, in that way. So our area uh, is, is what you see here in red. This is the roughly 30 acres that where there's an opportunity to, um, to bring back the energy uh, that we thought of. So what's important? There are historic themes of um, black history and culture. The African diaspora community was an essential element in the creation and building of Miami. Um, so thousands of Africans um, descendants located to Miami from other parts of the United States and Caribbean ports to construct the railroad that was there. They were actually counted in the original charter to start the city, so this was an important population there. Um, they were prohibited from living in any other part of Miami. If you were black, this is where you lived. Um, so these people and their descendants settled in this area now, and they created this fantastic, unique culture that exists today. So, for much of the 20th century, Overtown was the thriving center of black culture, entertainment, um, and business. For Miami and, and many parts of just South Florida in general, um, at its peak, Overtown was home to approximately 40,000 people. It was a self-sustaining community based on self-reliance. Um, many, many owned uh, black businesses and institutions. It's, it had a um, main street, which was Second Avenue, that became known as Little Broadway. So if you think about this part of Miami being what they considered the, the Little Broadway of the New York City of the South, um, just sh due to the sheer volume of, of um, entertainment businesses and venues located there. So it was the host of um, the most prominent black leaders of the 20th century and entertainers, including you know, people like Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, Billie Holiday, Aretha Franklin, Lena Horne, it just goes on and on. Um, but ironically, even these black entertainers who performed in Miami Beach, they could not stay in the hotels there, so they all would come back and overnight, um, had to overnight in, in Overtown. So it really became this, this mecca and a, an attraction for black talent. Um, and by the way, they would stay up all night still creating music. So they would, they would come together and it was a real opportunity to, to create music. So um, what happened in Overtown? We, we all know um, urban renewal. You know, first it was a double whammy. First the highway construction, then um, uh, condemnation and, and urban renewal. Um, so after the construction of, of both of these interstates, that led to disinvestment, decline. The population moved out to many, many other parts of the Miami region. It's not clear to trace exactly where um, the population dispersed to. But today, of course, Over, Overtown enjoys this highly desirable location. Um, and so this is the opportunity for us to think about um, how to do a few things. Um, looking at the lost local landmarks, there were many um, that were there, and, and there's still some that are, that are still there that, that we're going to talk about, but, but those are um, some of the, the, the prominent ones. Um, during its heyday, uh, this notion of strong uh, and this notion of self-sustaining community, strong spirit of entrepreneurship, um, was symbolized by something called Good Bread Alley. So there was a prolific artist called Purvis Young that was uh, in Overtown. And um, Purvis Young, you know, 
many, many people, there, there are spoken and written accounts of this area, um, neighborhood called Good Bread Alley, because of n names as such, because of the aroma of freshly baked bread that the residents made in their homes, and they sort of sold it out the back of their homes and front porches to pacifiers on the street. So Purvis Young actually did a full mural that you will see that was his interpretation of, of Good Bread Alley. And what was important to him, he wanted to make sure that people saw these boarded up, he took um, boarded up homes, and instead of leaving the plywood up, these massive areas of, of uh, real estate that was boarded up, he painted uh, this, this um, art piece of Good Bread Alley. And he wanted to make sure that people saw it from the, the highway, 95, 395, that, that destroyed um, their area. So um, his highly charged artwork, it expressed the energy and the sense of the community, but also um, there's an underlying tone of um, sort of wanting to escape the, the oppression that, that existed in those areas um, after they su suffered these multiple blows. So again, we, there was um, things that uh, writing sort of a, a vision statement of um, what we wanted Overtown to be. We needed to bring back um, energy and it needed to be specifically black energy in, in many, many ways. Um, so bring the folks back to live, bring back local investment, make it a center again, make it compact and, and walkable um, and a distinct place. We looked at the existing um, historic buildings that you see there in white, and there are many. There was the home, they're still there today, the home of um, the Dorsey home, the first um, millionaire in, in Miami, the historic Lyric Theater. Um, we are also bringing a red rooster to that area, and so that is, um, is an investment that's really going to, um, to add the energy there. Looking at the existing cultural elements that you see in red, uh, the artist Gary Moore actually did a wonderful streetscape design um, decades ago in the 80s that we want to revitalize and bring back. And there's also some public, very little, but there are some open public, uh, public space opportunities that we want to, to leverage. So in looking at these examples um, that you see here of, of um, these historic um, uh, assets that exist, the Dorsey House, uh, Gary Moore Streetscape, Lyric Theater. Um, we looked at making really four significant moves. Um, if you think about the green uh, strip there, that is about um, restoring uh, the entrance back to the neighborhood. The blue is about the entertainment and nightlife. The orange is about history and culture, and the purple is about bringing that heart back. That, that used to be there, the heart and energy back to what we're calling um, Second Ave Court. Looking at um, bringing back art and performance, um, greening is huge always in these areas, and I'm gonna actually talk about that a little bit more in, in, a, in a minute, but a lot of these places are just devoid of landscape, so bringing back parklets um, and pocket parks and special structures, thresholds and markers. So we envisioned really um, focusing first on, on the existing art and identity that is there, um, bringing back in that culture and establishing an authentically overtown design identity. So looking at music that was huge, that was created there, and thinking about um, this notion of, of repetition, but also um, the, the rhythm and variety of, of the streetscape design, bringing that back in. Really looking at um, the public realm, the materialities and the identity, uh, bringing in interpretation. So always in the pavement there are, there are markers uh, that, are, that are memorializing um, some event, some person uh, that's uh, important to the area. This is a way of thinking about how um, the parklets and, and greening the place can come back in and, and using banners and light poles and wayfinding to actually um, frame identity. 
So in the end, when you look at, um, again, this is, this is exactly where the red rooster is going to locate, but when you look at um, bringing in site enhancement, all of the things in the public realm that really make the space important, the, this is our version of a placeholder of a Purvis Young-like type sculpture collaborating with artists, we would realize what that actually would be in, instead of a placeholder, but it's very important to allow those opportunities for public art there. This is looking down that historic grid at the Ward Rooming House and the Dorsey House and how from even from a historic perspective you can protect those assets while still revitalizing uh, the street streetscape. And um, on the you know, smaller scale, using buildings, um, public art, mural art, um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more extensively, is extremely important. That is what this community did. Uh, that is what Purvis Young did. And um, also, as a backdrop to small scale retail and pedestrian oriented spaces. So just really weaving those into a nice tapestry along with public art um, porches and arcades, and to really create what um, we would imagine the executive director of the CRA said. He, he told us when we started this project, he said, I want to be able to fly over Miami in an airplane, and this district should look distinct from any other thing that I see around it. So as we know, with development, driving density and height is extremely important from a financial performance perspective. But if you put that aside and think about um, bringing back identity and culture into an area, uh, and you have the developer in this case who, who is aligned with that vision, you do get a, an appearance overhead that's vibrant and lively and green and lush and low scale and intimate and walkable. So that's, um, a, a vision that we believe will be realized as part of this um, master plan. And finally, this, this is the last project, and this one's um, kind of large, so Miami Overtown was 30 acres. Um, this is 1.3 miles, so this is Destination Crenshaw in southern uh, Los Angeles. And the way to describe this, when we first started, the cl client hired us and they came to me and they said, well, we want an outdoor museum. And I said, well, I've never done an outdoor museum, I've done indoor museums. And so over time, we've become to describe this project as really um, a, a uh, experience, a community-inspired public art and streetscape design project. And the goal of this project is to highlight the world-class contributions of black Los Angeles and to help revitalize the current heart of that community. Um, so this will be the first outdoor project of its kind in Los Angeles that will strategically use an iconic street, city street name to anchor and really provide context for public artwork and streetscape design. So hashtag Destination Crenshaw is, is the name and so what um, started this project was um, equally perplexing to me in um, original conversations with this community. This um, project is the result of the new um, metro line that's going to go from LAX when you fly in now all the way up um, through our community in Crenshaw to the blue line which is called the Expo line. So. Wonderful, we all like transit projects and we all appreciate transit-oriented development. We don't appreciate what they do in terms of, um, of the economics of, uh, of making it unlivable for, for people that, that live there from a financial perspective, but we appreciated that. What was important about this project is the city decided to build that line and in every area where the the line penetrated a, a commercial corridor, the city either elevated the train line above the streetscape or they went below, except in Crenshaw. When they came in Crenshaw, they plowed um, right through this neighborhood and at first, what you see right there in orange at Crenshaw and, and Slauson, which is a, a, a um, 
very prominent intersection for those of you who are familiar with South Los Angeles, they weren't even going to put a metro stop. The city fought to get that metro stop that you see there um, in the orange color at, at Crenshaw and Slauson. So the community got that metro stop, um, but then um, a whole lot of work had, had to be done. So um, this has been uh, years now, uh, two, two, two and a half years of really, really co-design, co-partners. Um, our clients in this instance are, are essentially politicians. Um, we're working with, uh, uh, the policymakers are huge. You cannot do and, and sort of come up against um, forces such as uh, infrastructure. When people want it in, um, it goes in. Design can, can only do so much outside of partnering with, with folks to, to try to get this done. So um, many, many, uh, you know, uh, years of, of engagement. Um, so our original vision was to do um, these four things. Uh, so, you know, South Los Angeles has um, a rich, rich culture of all of the, the major artists that, have, that, are, that we know today. If you think about them, Ken, Hinde Wiley, Kerry James Marshall, Mark Bradford, they all came out of South Los Angeles. These are visual artists. Think about all the performing arts, you know, artists that have come out of that area. You think of the, all the cultures that have come out of there, the clothing culture, the car culture. Well, all this stuff is sort of appropriated in areas um, outside of uh, even California. It's so, you know, you can, even in, within California, there are things that are made in Crenshaw that can be sold in West Hollywood, but that neighborhood does not get the benefit of that investment. So this is literally about, this is an economic case, it's about catalyzing growth um, and, and celebrating and contributing and recognizing this heritage. So this was a really challenging issue. Um, we had so many things at play, from architecture to landscape, architecture to the huge metro you know uh, line um, and authority to interpretive design to tell all these wonderful stories Tom Bradley's story Tina Turner I mean so many wonderful Biddy Mason stories that that had that needed to come out to and also making this a huge case about art so it was a bit of a head scratcher and um, I was at the time reading, um, and I, it's, it's wonderful to be here in New York because I was reading Dr. Mindy Thompson Full of Love's book, Root Shock. Um, and uh, you know, everyone here, of course, knows her uh, clinical psychiatrist and um, educator. But her book, you know, it inspires us all, which is basically focusing on you know the traumatic stress that can occur in communities when when constant disruption happens over time, that sort of disruption to one's emotional ecosystem. You go back in 400 years of um, African Americans in this country, there are things that were obviously overt, such as slavery, but then there are things that are still happening today in rapid succession that are not as overt, but still result in the same um, outcome of, of displacement and, and that ability, that feeling of instability and disruption. Today, mass gentrification, um, cultural erasure, all of these things are, are at play and are very relevant to us today. So it's still a continuum across uh, 400 years. And uh, so in thinking about, well, how in the world did, you know, I had to think about how did this, these African Americans get to that area of, of Crenshaw um, over the course of time because there's not very many intact African American populations west of, of um, you know, Chicago, Mississippi that have generations and generations and generations of African Americans still living there. So just looking at the forced global slave migration that we know that the diaspora actually affected just about every continent on the planet so we know that, um, that from, the, from the West Coast and Savannah, uh, from north to the Americas, um, migrating or, or the slave trade migrated west. Then the second great migration was from south to north. Um, and, and then uh, domestic migration, the first was from south to north, but then the second was from south 
to West, and that was after the war. So if you look at the population over the, of that area over the last 50 plus years, um, you can, with the blue, the dark blue really representing majority black, you can see how the population has shifted and really coalesced into um, the 2010 diagram, which is the corridor of, of Crenshaw, really right, right in there. And we'll see what the 2020 census says. So really this became a project for me about uh, thinking about this notion of root shock and thinking about how to, to sort of preserve one of the, the last areas um, short of you know, a areas in the east like um, certain parts of, of South Chicago or Harlem where we have generations of black, but out west, this is really it. And so metaphorically um, started thinking about this whole notion of, of migration, slave trade, how people get to where they are. And I, what really struck us was this, I, this notion of, um, of a grass in the African savanna. It's called the giant star grass of the African diaspora. And what was important to us about this grass was that it was used on as bedding hay during the slave period. And really, because it was used there, it was transported in many areas across um, the, the uh, United States and other areas in Europe. And it actually thrived where it should have died. It thrived in areas that were really inhospitable. And so today in the United States, that it's a, this grass is a rhizome grass, mean, meaning it has these roots that are, that are not extraordinarily deep. They're actually more shallow, but they're so interconnected. They're hard to uproot, and we all know it as Bermuda grass. And in certain areas of the country, this, this grass is um, it's considered with praise and disdain alike. So this, um, this statement about the giant star grass of the African diaspora was a wonderful metaphor for this community that has, in spite of root shock, um, it's established a strong, interconnected, well-rooted and thriving existence. It's flourished um, and it's continued to, to uh, contribute in a way that is um, you know, spontaneous, unexpected, the creativity sprouts up and contributes to our broader popular culture here in, Amer in, a, in America and beyond. So this notion of growing where you planted, we saw the way to tell this story along 1.3 miles um, through four significant lenses. The first being improvisation. Um, so we believe that this community was able to create and thrive um, because of the resourcefulness that was really, um, it's really a positive outcome of struggle, that, that ability to be resourceful. So the black culture here thrives and continues to push the boundaries, often because of limited access to resources. So the result of this improvisational spirit is a wholly unique and original form that of art and that is really exported and experienced worldwide. So, and ironically, that is the, um, the, uh, the intersection of Crenshaw and Slauson. Um, Nipsey Hussle was a huge supporter of, of this project, a partner really on this project. His marathon store is located um, right there. And as you all know, we lost Nipsey Hussle early, earlier this year. So, the next lens was first, and, and celebrating this notion of first stories of significant moments, historical first that impacted um, people from the personal and to the political, to the local, the international, so many first. And dreams, um, the realm of daydreams, what people can, uh, can, can possibly conceive of, aspire to, free of constraints, and finally, this notion of togetherness, which is the last lens, and this is the resilience of black culture that's really born out of a togetherness that's both ancestral and an ongoing necessity. So black people coming together to um, celebrate, mourn, resist, worship in, in just everyday life and living. So looking at these four lenses, um, we know that this will be the nation's largest outdoor experience dedicated to African-American art and culture. Um, 
positioning this iconic street name for this. It will include streetscapes, um, ex exhibits, major art installations, um, several small parks, and places for entertainment and celebration. The Voice, um, the Voice is absolutely unapologetically black in every way. It's bold and energetic, um, inspiring and uplifting, and it has to be diverse. So we can create a black space that is diverse and welcoming and inclusive. Um, so how we are doing this is looking at um, shade canopies that um, are, are inspired by the metaphor of the giant star grass. We're looking at um, interpretation um, brass strips in the pavement um, that's, met, that's inspired by the metaphor of the rhizome and, and these strips always run from east to west or south to north. And we're looking at um, banners and wayfinding systems and uh, that help tell the story. But in order to do that, we, we had to collaborate, again, this notion of broad collaboration beyond ourselves. So collaborating with illustrators from that community, embedded in that community, to actually um, represent historical figures in a quintessential sort of black LA aesthetic um, so that that feeling um, is pervasive across um, the entire 1.3-mile experience. Um, so working with local illustrators to create a unique Crenshaw graphic um, derived from this notion of, of traditional quilt making and how that interprets in branding and graphics and, and, and uh, wayfinding and placemaking um, is, uh, is evident in, in the storytelling, the interpretive panels. Um, that will tell many, many stories, Soul Train, Black Lives Matter, the epicenters of LA, Sundays on Crenshaw. So there's many stories that we're telling. There are many trailblazers that we're celebrating in, in the pavement, so interpretive elements um, of deceased members of the community and their contributions, as well as living members of the community. And this is also, ironically, a project about environmental equity. Um, so, in 2012, the city decided to, um, when they moved the space shuttle Endeavor to its, its final place, they brought it right down Crenshaw. Its final home is the, is the California Science Center in Los Angeles, but they brought it right down Crenshaw and wiped out every single tree. If you stand on that boulevard today, there is not a single tree. The first time I was out there, I, I it, it just, it's such a depressing feeling. I've never seen a place where you could look and not see a tree. So we're reforesting with um, over 800 trees, over 30,000 a square foot of landscaping, over four acres of, of open space, and, um, and bringing back, you know, sort of the indigenous um, planting that, that was there, and a lot of the Afrocentric pl uh, palette, planting palette, um, along with mixed California natives. So really getting back in a very human way, basic um, things that we take for granted, such as uh, vegetation. It's about public art. There's over 100 2D and 3D art opportunities. And again, uh, there were, there's about 10 very, very high profile artists that we're in collaboration with to do signature pieces. And just like, um, other areas such as Harlem, it, you know, that are undergoing gentrification or, or cer um, certain other changes, those spaces still resonate with the African American community because you have things like, you know, you're not going to move the Alan, the Adam Clayton Powell statue. You're, you know, there are things that are there that mark these spaces that are really, really important. So um, in the last couple minutes here, I'll just give you a glimpse. This is a massive project, but I'll give you a glimpse of what we're doing at the Four Nose. At Improvisation, um, we are doing a 120-foot um, sign monument that, um, that will establish and mark this place as Crenshaw. It's, it's uniquely designed to represent um, raw materials, steel, and how um, basic everyday materials can be twisted um, to form uh, uh, things in creative ways. So that's our, our sort of monument marker that's uh, really important. 
we're working, with, this is a pocket park here. This is a, we're, uh, Alison Saar is doing a, a piece here that's a placeholder for her sculptures of work. You can see how the shade canopies come together, the paving, the rhizome patterns, the banner. Um, this is another pocket park that's, that's uh, got a piece, the, the um, I Am, Brenna Youngblood, Youngblood's piece here in, in this pocket park. As we move to dreams, this is um, an example of the um, historic collateral that is there at this um, area. So this is, um, we're putting a, a, um, a pocket park on top of this wall. Um, and the reason for that is that this is the, um, the Our Mighty Contribution mural that's been there, an iconic um, piece in Crenshaw for years. The mural has undergone probably on the course of, I think it was originally, it's probably up 50 years old and it's probably had about 10 iterations of this. So bringing back and, and celebrating um, this mural and actually putting across the street an elevated platform to see the mural, um, again with, with pieces of, um, of artwork by prominent artists here. And lastly, uh, the last park is togetherness. This, this was a stretch. We wanted to really put an exclamation park on the end of this boulevard here. And so uh, we were inspired by one of the early meetings where um, one of our um, key folks in the community, she actually held up a Sankofa. Um, we do a lot of um, exercises that take people out of the realm of, of strict architecture and design in, in the um, built form and just talk about memories and things that are, that are special to them. And so she held up the Sankofa, and Sankofa is obviously the African uh, term meaning to, to go back and get what was taken. It's really about remembering your past um, so that you have a more positive future uh, moving forward. So thinking about uh, this the Sankofa, and, and by the way, the, the, I, I should show you before I move from this image, the, um, the bike lanes are the, are the sort of the black power fist that, uh, that came out of LA, so that was really critical to this community. But in thinking about um, how to just do an, an experience that, um, the design that allows people to come together to celebrate, but that really elevates, turns back, looks down the 1.3 mile Boulevard that brings in um, special pieces uh, that that uh, placeholder shown there by by these local artists that allows um, underneath a shaded area and spot uh, for people to to come together. You can actually even drive. We made it so that you can actually bring back the car culture and drive lowriders through there, and a place that people feel welcomed. It's spirit. Uh, it's a spirited place lots of energy, looking back down the boulevard, shaded. And if you look in the other direction, you can actually see the sign for the, um, the Vision Theater historic marker, then all the way back um, through on a clear day. I should give a caveat. You can see the Hollywood Hills sign uh, in the background. We did see it on a clear day. There, there are clear days in Los Angeles, believe it or not. So. Um, this notion of the Sankofa and, and this boulevard, um, I'll leave you with this quote by, um, by Dr. Fuller Love that talks about the, the power of, of investment of time and money to transform um, a neighborhood and encouraging people to stay, not sell, because um, once you leave these communities, it's very hard. You never get enough money to buy back in. So um, really uh, thinking about um, what we can do to, um, to uh, honor that. So, thank you. And I'll invite Mabel up. Yeah, these are on. Oh, wow. <laughs> it filled up in here. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say thank you, um, Zena, for a really extraordinary um, and rich presentation. Um, so I know there are probably many hands in the audience. 
I'm going to be a little selfish because <laughs> I had some questions that I, I wanted to ask you, and I'll give you a moment to catch your breath because I think it's really remarkable that you really started out um, talking about, you know, one, certain, certain, you know, acknowledging the importance of Max as a figure, Phil, um, they, were, they were essential to um, the museum project, right? It's Freelon, Ajay Bond, and Smith Group, right? Um, and the ways in which the experience of working on museums was integral to the formation of what you call remembrance design and remembrance work, which I find very powerful um, concepts. And I think you've really said, okay, we can, we can think about them as institutions, we can think about them as discrete buildings, but what if they're liberated? What does it mean to actually go out into communities um, and use these ideas around history, around um, collective memory, around reconciliation, um, to see what kind of work that can actually do um, within communities. And so you start out with a very small community and you end up with, with Crenshaw. And it, it's a really extraordinary project. And certainly for me, you've told a lot of my family <laughs> history uh, in that. Pro I am part of the Sycamore Hill technically diaspora. It was my, my mother's church, actually. And uh, Zena's been working with my aunt and uncle, which she did not know until very recently, on the Sycamore Hill project. Um, but I also think, I, I really appreciated that you ended with um, Dr. Fully Love, who's done really remarkable work with this idea of root shock. Um, and I'm wondering, my first question to you would be, um, as you have groups do that memory work, right, to really make connections to um, our immediate community, to our ends, I mean, to really think about the legacy of diaspora migration, um, how do you also, you know, which, which can be uh, joyous connections, celebratory connections, things that we can express, when you start to remind not only the history, but, but a sense of that collective memory, you also do hit these moments of difficulty, of difficult histories. And I love that Lonnie Bunch, you know, has, has said with whom you worked, said that often black history is hiding in plain sight. It's just there. It's been hidden. It's been erased. It's been repressed. Um, and a lot of what you show are the kind of legacies of Jim Crow segregation, uh, then urban renewal, the violence of the freeways. It's just astonishing. The erasure of whole groups of people and the legacy that they were invested in. You know, and then on the heels of that gentrification, just coming knocking at the door. Um, so with that, you know, you're also plumbing history, but you're also plumbing very difficult emotions in history. So with remembrance work and with the architecture that you're developing, how do you think design plays a role in that, both as a process and then as, as, as it is inhabited? Um, yeah, thanks. And by the way, um, Mabel, I, I was actually in the Sycamore Hill community. I was with her aunt and uncle on Thursday night who told me to give her a message to call them sometimes. <laughs> so, anyway, so I'm publicly giving that message. So, uh, okay. um, But that, that's a really good question. And, and that has evolved. This, this is um, new territory for us. And I, and I want to acknowledge, you know, this, this was... Um, started come, like as you mentioned coming out of, of that and I and when Phil Freelon was a was alive we talked about this you know five years ago and um, it's architecture and design can't do everything like Mabel said it's, it's, it's one lever and um, it's it's and it only works in in deep collaboration with with many many folks as, as you guys can see one of the things that I had to get used to was that um, first engaging with these communities, there's a lot of hurt. So I thought, my God, you know, you have to go and get your psychology degree or something. You know, we're, we're architects, you know. It's, it's difficult sometimes to hear that. But over time, you realize that the pain in a lot of people, they had to release that. And you have to provide that that sort of outlet for them to, to do that, and that sort of hearing. So a lot of it is, at first, is just listening. If you can think of architects not being, you know, it's very rare that we shut up and sit down and put our egos in a box and, and listen. Um, and once you move past that and engage them in the design process, I mean, and they actually will start um, sketching because we believe that um, you have to listen visually, but if, even if you can't get um, people to, to really talk about something, they can, they can sketch something, they can draw. 
And it's amazing. And uh, even in Sycamore Hill, um, you know, we had people saying, wow, you know, we, you actually want us to draw something? So it, it becomes um, therapeutic in a lot of ways. And then once you get past that threshold, you really start um, moving fast forward towards design solutions that, um, that they're a part of and they have buy-in to and they feel like they're going to take this, they're going to sustain this when we're gone. So it's a really, um, it's not a process that, um, that you sit down and, and you write and, oh, aha, we have it. It's literally developing um, over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because I wonder, I mean, the Crenshaw story about the endeavor mm -hmm. is typical. <laughs> you know, it's the typical of the freeway. It's like, oh, we need to get something done. We need to connect here and there. Let's ram it through the black community. Mm -hmm. So what are the techniques that you have of building trust when you do remembrance work, mm -hmm. right? Because as I remember, I don't know if I would trust the politician or the planner mm -hmm. or, or the architect just in terms of the ways in which the various disciplines have rendered forms of violence mm -hmm. to, to, to communities, to the environment. And so are there particular things that you do as a process to get people to kind of trust and open up? Yeah. There are things that you do, but more importantly are who, who you're involving in the process. So I'll give you an example. Um, so a, a couple years ago, there was a, I got a phone call from a community in Alaska, and it was about um, indigenous, you know, the indigenous um, community there that had been displaced. But the phone call was from a very sincere, very well-meaning, um, middle-aged Caucasian woman and, and, and a group that, that she had of other Caucasian women who saw sort of this, um, this um, hurt uh, that was done and continuously being done to a community there and wanted to do something about it. And well, you know, can you, you know, at least you know come talk to us and, and let's see what can be done. Well, that's that's a non-starter right there for me because I asked her two questions. I said, um, well, who is involved from that community? No one. And you can't you can't do for for someone else like that. And then I said, well, well, who are you engaged with at at um, the thought leaders, the critical thinkers in the community, the politicians? Who else? No one else. So first you have to do the good work of understanding who to bring to the table because those people are the ones that are respected in the community. They're not gonna respect an outsider coming in telling them what to do. Um, you have to actually be invited into that community uh, to do the good work. So that's how you get the respect. It's always, as usual, on the heels or coattails of, of people who, have, um, who know that community and and have a level of trust um, and sincerity in what we do. Other processes are, um, you know, just about, um, you know, the memory exercises that we talked about. It's all about you don't know what you're going to get, and you actually have to leave it that that wide open. You actually have to say, um, I'm not. We're not telling you to bring, you know, your favorite building or, or park that you saw. You're actually just bringing together um, some anything that you want to you want to tell us. So it's real. It's a real openness that's needed to do it. Um, and so the second question, um, and so I'll do this and then just open it up because I'm sure there, there are questions in the audience, um, is we have a number of students who are here. Um, and um, I think it's really important, both, both here as part of NOMAS, um, but also as part of the, the uh, educational community here in New York City. Um, and we were kind of technically classmates. <laughs> I was fourth year and you were yeah, first year. We, right. we both went to UVA. Um, I was curious, what is it, uh, what was it within your um, education of architecture that has kind of led you down the path or opened up these kinds of questions that you're now engaged in in, in practice? That's really good as a student, and, and keep in mind, and so I've got to tell Mabel's age, as I said, tell mine, so that was over 30 years ago. So, <laughs> so, so you know, it's, it's been a minute, and, and obviously um, architectural education has changed, but back then, um, it wasn't as um, multidisciplinary as it is now. There wasn't this awareness of the power of, of, um, of uh, collaborating, you know, at, at this level, so I think probably less the architectural education at that time because it's, it's you know, a while ago, and, and just more um, the making the choice to, to work. Um, and it's not just African-American uh, communities. There, there are um, 
other communities, any, anybody even on an economic uh, level that um, has been uh, removed from the whole process of, of design and determining their own fate of their own communities. And I just think it's, it's really the people that I've associated with and worked with over the years. When I went to work for um, Phil Freelon 16 years ago, the number one thing that made me say, yes, I think I will pick up where I'm living and move down to North Carolina and, uh, and work for the Freelon Group um, was, was this whole philosophy of, of his philosophy of great design being accessible to all. And I knew that that was a place that would allow me, and an attitude that would allow this type of exploration to happen. So less about the education and more about, you know, um, people that working with uh, firms and people that have shared values around these issues. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's very much about seeking out those people whose values you actually um, yes. admire. But it also, I think, is very important is to find those places um, and uh, instances where the education continues, mm -hmm. right? Because what I think is remarkable about the work you show, you know, are the collaborations and the people that you're drawing into the process. And also, clearly, there's an amazingly rich dialogue. I think you know, in the work that is really producing, I think, what's exci this, the exciting things that we're actually seeing mm -hmm. here as well. And, and I think that's really phenomenal. Yeah. So, so why don't we open it up to questions? I think there are mics on both sides. Um, we have an extraordinary educator oh, wow. <laughs> in the audience, Dr. Sharon <laughs> Sutton. <laughs> So I want to begin, Azina, by echoing uh, Maybell's thanks for a very inspiring lecture of seeing all of those spaces from small to large being uh, reclaimed um, from their racist choking off uh, and through a, a deep dive into history but also through this participatory process that you're describing. I come to this lecture every year, and when I attend, I always try to listen to it through the ears of Max. And I knew him as a student during a time that was similar to now. There was a lot of violence, there was a lot of police brutality, there was a, a different kind of war, but there was the destruction of war. Um, and one thing that stuck out as I was listening to you was something that he used to say, which was, uh, you know, if you had a society that everybody was included in, you wouldn't need a police force, or you wouldn't need a military. So one of the ways that people have been trying to get included since um, the days of the 1963 that we began with um, is through protest. But it doesn't seem to be working. I, I participated a, about a month ago in the uh, Young People's uh, Earth protest. And it, it, we seem to be at the limit of protest because people are just getting further and further apart. So I'm wondering, as someone um, who has been involved in so many participatory processes, what you would think about the idea of becoming more inclusive through placemaking rather than through protests. And I'm asking that on behalf of Max. I appreciate that on behalf of Max, um, certainly, and thank you so much. And, and um, that's a wonderful question. And that, um, that is the avenue that I'm, I've chosen for myself um, because I, I do believe that, um, that sense of place and, and placemaking and, and having space um, where I've heard so many people, um, African Americans in particular, talk about 
um, not being able to go places because they don't feel accessible, they don't feel inclusive, and they don't even feel financially accessible. And we haven't even talked about how uh, many of these projects um, bring in the fact of, of living in an affordable, dignified manner. Um, so place and, and land and, and ownership um, is huge because that's probably the, the number one thing amongst all the other things such as freedom and the like that these communities have lost the most. And um, I, I don't have anything against um, protests. As a matter of fact, in, in Crenshaw, um, you know, we, we're, being, we're being front and center about Black Lives Matter that started, that we know out of that. And, and that is, um, is, is very, very necessary movements and, and protests. So, um, but, I, but I do think that architecture and design um, can help imbue culture, and I believe um, firmly that culture can be used to help stand against a lot of these forces because some of them aren't overt. Gentrification is largely economic, regardless of whatever. It's, it's really driven by the economy, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna stop that overnight, right? But we can, but we can use culture and lead with culture um, to help you know, people who come into an area not feel like um, that they bring a culture better to replace but they contribute to the prevailing culture and make it um, something special and not, not erase. So uh, I, I, I do subscribe to that. In the spirit of Max, I'm, I hope, I believe that he would too. Uh, there's also a mic on this side as well. Um, so on your left, if you could. Hi, I'm uh, really impressed by your work. Um, and I'm just wondering about Sure. I'm just a little concerned. Um, black culture has launched a lot of economic ships, uh, and quite often it hasn't come back to the community. And oddly enough, the kind of packaging of black trauma, whether it's in the visual arts or in music or in the built environment, is kind of very much in vogue right now. So I'm wondering, as these places are transformed or beautified or kind of become expressive of black culture, how you protect gentrification and other forms of, of change from displacing the people who are there? I mean, how do you, or, or how do you think about building in uh, ownership or control into the beautification that does happen? Because that obviously becomes attractive for people outside of the community, for other developers, and you know, it's uh, it can be a double-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword, and, and as we talk about that all the time, there are, there are certain communities. You know, anytime you bring, like in Crenshaw, transit-oriented development, um, increases rental rates in as much as sixty percent. So literally, every single across the board, every time you do that, you're at risk. For, for displacing um, people. That's why you have to think about and, and get ahead of these projects um, and really partner with folks and policymakers and politicians to, um, to you know, control the, the development, the land ownership that is there and to keep people from selling. That, that's the risk, right? You, you come in, somebody puts a new transit line and suddenly your property value goes up twice what it was and somebody comes in and offers you to sell your home. It, you're a private homeowner, you can sell it. We can't stop that. We can only educate people to the fact that um, it's probably more important for you to stay, particularly for, for gen long-term generational wealth because you really won't be able to, these folks can't buy in. When they buy again, it's way out in the suburbs where there's, you know, no trans mass uh, transit, um, very little infrastructure to support them. So we really have to think about um, the fact that design can't do everything, and that that's what I tell everybody: is partnerships. Design is one aspect in partnership that can do everything, 
And if you think about areas across the country that you go to, that you, you can go someplace that's called Chinatown, right? And see very little Chinese people living there, but it's still culturally marked as Chinatown or Asia town. You, you see it all the time. And so this, this is no different. You're marking the culture. You're honoring the, the history of the culture that's there, but, um, but you're not coming back and suddenly everything's been replaced by, um, you know, a bunch of strip malls and gaps and, you know, and Lululemons and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's craziness, right? You don't even recognize what it ever was. So that's, a, that's a, the only answer that I have as to how we can begin to address it. Hi, Zena. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tierra. I have two um, things to say. First is a comment. Um, the neighborhood that I grew up in in St. Louis um, has been flattened and turned into a baseball field for a private um, male high school. And uh, I feel some of those feelings and emotions that you talked about when I go back home to visit because I don't have a place to go back home and visit. So um, thank you for the work that you're doing. And then the second thing I want us to talk about is kind of related to what this gentleman just said. Um, it's more so on the policy side. Um, do you foresee policymakers coming up with creative um, methods of preventing um, gentrification? You know, um, as a person who is now entering into policy myself, um, it's a little, um, um, what's the correct term? I'm a little on edge about it because um, I know my ideas are a little out of the box, but I, I'm, I'm imagining something like uh, people who already exist there, when their properties double in value and now they can't afford their taxes, is there an incremental way we can increase their taxes so they're not double um, of what they were the previous year? Or uh, do you see, foresee any creative solutions like that happening with policymakers? I can tell you from experience that the, um, the best example that I have is, is Vancouver. And when they first said that they, the community there was going for a land trust, it was like, you know, no, 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 you're not gonna get that. I mean, who's the city, right? I mean, are, are, you know, it was unthinkable because I can't think of that I can't imagine where I sit here today that, you know, I haven't had an experience where that has happened in the United States, yeah. but it's happening there on the small scale where, um, where you know, you can protect um, that investment and what happens to that for um, a perpetual amount of time. Uh, I would like to see more models like that because mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to gentrification. It's a huge mass gentrification. Yeah. You know, some certain level is fine, but mass gentrification and, and the result of displacement, I don't have all of the answers, um, but I do know that, um, yeah, and people talk about opportunity zones and, and all the things that um, you know, the governments are trying to do to protect uh, people from just economically being displaced. All those things are happening. You know, this is real time because this change in cities is occurring so rapidly yeah, yeah. that um, that in hindsight, you know, we'll, we'll have better answers. But today, where people are really just kind of reacting, scrambling around to protect, to make cities affordable, ma maintain multi generational, um, you know, communities diverse communities and not let them all be the realm of rich, uh, rich Caucasians at this point yeah. um, that, uh, you know, that, that make them not inclusive. So it's really a non-answer, but it's the best answer that I have. And I'm, I'm really looking to see, honestly, what, what actually happens in Vancouver. Okay. Stay tuned. Thank so you. So we have time for two more. So we'll take this question and then this last question. Quasi Daniels. First of all, thank you for everything that you brought up. Um, when you are talking about these historic spaces, are you also looking at getting them listed on the register? Are these historic because of the, the local knowledge, or are these historic because they've been documented? Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, with that, do you, if they are being documented, are you seeing those as opportunities to protect these environments as gentrification is taking place? 
and finding ec economic opportunities as a result of that to, you know, potentially push back against gentrification as it happens. Yeah, so a lot of these communities have historic assets that are on the um, national or local uh, register. So they're, they're bona fide, the Lyric Theater, um, you know, in Miami. Uh, so, but it's not like you don't have whole zones that are, I mean, you have the historic my, um, Overtown District or you, uh, an area that's called historic, but there are very little um, assets, actually buildings that are in these places. So those are protected. And those, obviously, you can get resources to help restore or, um, you know, revitalize or rehab. The, your second question was about can you, um, can are, you. Are you looking at this as, as an economic driver as well or just more of a place-making experience? It's, it's an economic driver. But, for instance, on Crenshaw, um, what's happening at the same time with design is um, a massive campaign for small businesses. So again, that's happening in parallel um, to, to bring small businesses back, get people in investments, um, things set up for small businesses. There are the actual council district eight is actually the businesses that do exist. They're actually um, uh, have um, vehicles to give them money and funds to revitalize their storefronts. So this is all happening in parallel because if you do this wonderful, nice corridor to your point or the gentleman before you and her point, it's going to be attractive for people and they're going to want to come and they're going to want to buy up this stuff pretty cheap and put some, some you know, pretty slick development there. So um, that level of investment is happening in parallel on the policy side and the, and the uh, lawmaker side. Last little piece with this. So I saw that there were a lot of 2D, you mentioned a lot of 2D and 3D, but really from a sculptural standpoint, how permanent do you see these elements? Because as you look around with a lot of gentrification, particularly from the art side, you can have murals that come up, but if they're in a, say in front of an empty lot, building goes up and it's erasing that. So yeah. are you seeing these as opportunities to create a more permanent experience? Or is it still a fragile experience that we are currently seeing that's a good question on, on the public art piece. So there are three levels, for instance, in Crenshaw and public art. The first level of artists that we're working with are 10. These are signature pieces. So these are, these are, these are you know, million dollar pieces. They're not going anywhere. These, these, are, these are the top name artists in, in the United States right now that came out of um, South Central Los Angeles. So 10 pieces, signature pieces over 1.3 mile. So then there's a second sort of layer belong, be, um, beyond that that's still not an open call for artists, but it's really pulling in uh, that next tier that may not be the, the, the you know, national renowned, but still pretty significant um, uh, uh, pieces. And then there's kind of the open call, because we want that, that mural art, we want that graffiti art. When I went to South Los Angeles, they literally had to put me in a car drive me around to all these different places to see this wonderful, wonderful graffiti art and, and mural art. You know, in their areas like Wynwood in, in um, Miami, that, you know, you go there, you can see it all in one place. It's actually beautiful, so we want to bring that out. That doesn't mean that this, the, that level of art stays forever. That's meant to keep, you know, changing out and growing. So there are actually three levels. One that's really, really permanent. I mean, it's millions and millions of dollars of investment. A second one that's probably semi-permanent, and then one that's really meant to just grind and, and, and change out over time. Thank you. Hi, thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, my question is partly out of my own curiosity. Uh, I was wondering if you can share of a situation where you felt like pulling out of a project because you felt that the interest of the stakeholders uh, or clients didn't, didn't align with your interest of burying the community? And if you did or did not pull out, uh, what did it take for you to stay? That's a really good question. When we started this, um, it was very difficult to, to do this because as designers, um, and you know, I'm blessed to be a part of fabulous, fantastic design work. And as designers, and particularly the, the building work, 
you, you think about the fact that you don't want to, um, and I think we're trained, back to your question about architecture school, to some extent, you don't want to invite too many people in the process because you feel like it might compromise the design. You don't ever want it to be designed by democracy and what if somebody has kind of a weird opinion. So there was a real fear uh, of doing this. And so it took a lot to sort of um, pull back and, and say, we're gonna allow this to happen and, and see what grows. And actually working on the National Museum of African American History and Culture also taught me this as well um, because I saw from our original design competition um, entry to what got built, um, a, there was a lot over those many, many years, but you see how people coming into the process is it's difficult, it's surely easier if you can just do it yourself, but in the end, it makes for a better result. And so you have to believe that. So no, there's not, so far there hasn't been a community that I pulled out of and walked away from um, because I'm careful, and we are all careful, my, my team, about the communities that we go into and that we agree to work in. Um, and we have to make sure that, that they're established, that they have um, you know, those, those leaders in place, um, that the values are aligned, and that they really want the, the outcomes that we're seeking. So the answer to that is no so far, fingers crossed. So can we say thank you to Zena? And I think we've got some time. And also a big thank you to Mabel. So hello everyone, for those who don't know me, I am Kimberly Dowdell, the 2019-2020 National President of NOMA. So thank you all for, uh, for coming from all across the country. I think we may have some Canadians here too and maybe some, some other places around the world to, to come to NOMA. Um, this is a great kickoff event. So again, thank you for being here. And also thank you for speaking to the theme that, um, that I've put forward for the two years that I'm president planning to stay. So that's part of the reason why I chose Brooklyn and next year we're gonna be in Oakland. Uh, which has similar issues just all the way on the other side of the country. Um, and so I think you spoke to that very beautifully and, th and thank you for your presentation and, and Mabel again, thank you for moderating. So just as a small token of appreciation, we just have a couple of gifts for you and I'm gonna give you those and then Sam is going to um, help us out with some logistical announcements. Yes. As many of you guys are gonna be joining us on the lovely walk to the Center for Architecture, if you are going back to the hotel, there is a bus leaving right now and then there are two other buses that will be headed to the Center for Architecture, prioritizing with needs. Okay, that's my announcements. 